Well, it is a great privilege to be here today. And I'm so happy to watch the baby dedication. And I hope he gave you as a church a charge as well. Because it's our responsibility to rear every child in our church and to make sure they do well all their life, isn't it? Get to know each child by name. And every time there's an event in their life, let the church be part of that too. Today I'm going to be speaking out of two passages. One is uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. And the other is from Ephesians chapter 5. Arachim Petros, chapter. Yes, chapter three, verse Peter. Chapter three. So what? And <laughs> Tesnelovce <laughs> Ինչպես Սարան հնազանդեր Աբրահամի նրան տեր կոչելով որի որդիներն եք եղելու որ բարեգործ լինեք եւ ոչ մի երկյուղից չվախենաք նմանապես է մարդիկ իմաստությունով բնակվեցեք նրանց հետ ինչպես տկար անոթի կանանց պատիվ տալով իբրեւ կյանքի շնորհքի ժառանգագիծներ որ ձեր աղօթքը չխափանվի եւ վերջապես ամեն այդ համամիտ կարեկից եղբայրացել բարեսիրտ քաղցրաբարո եղեք Չարի փոխարեն, չար չհատուցան է, կամ բանվասանքի փոխարեն բանվասանք, այլ ընդհակարակը օրնեցե գիտենալով, որ իսկ սորա մեջ կանչվեցար, որ օրնությունը ժառանգեք, որով հետև ով որ կամենում է կյանք սիրել եւ լավ լավ օրեր տեսնել, թող իր լեզուն ճարությունից դուր բանել եւ իր շրթուկները որ ներկություն չխոսեն։ Չարից է յետ քաշվի եւ բարիան է խաղաղություն որոնում եւ նրան հետեւել։ որով հետեւ տիրոջ աչքերն արթարների վրա են եւ նրա ականջները դեպի նրա աղօթքը տիրոջ երեսը չարագործների վրա է One of the uh, most important decisions we make in our life Մեր կյանքի կարևորագույն որոշումներից մեկը որ կայացնում ենք is making sure that we're marriage material Այն է որ People sometimes talk about uh, choosing the right person. Well, first we have to be the right person. And that's what parents do. They help their children develop character. Because if you're the right kind of person, then 
then out of three and a half billion people, you have the freedom to choose your mate. That seems overwhelming sometimes, doesn't it? That's why we must choose wisely. Peter gives us some advice here. And some people say, well, it's a little bit old-fashioned for me. I met my wife when she was 15 years old. When I saw her, I turned to my friend. I said, I'm going to marry her. He said, tonight? I said, no, not tonight. The longest two years of my life was waiting two years before I did marry her. We just finished our 50th anniversary. Do you know what this marriage goes on? It gets better and better. If you treat each other well. Longevity has nothing to do with the quality of marriage. Mm -hmm. But if each person in a marriage makes a point, makes a point of making it a contest to see who can outplease the other. Then marriage just gets better and better. One of our goals in marriage is to make our mate our best friend. And that's when things really begin to sizzle in our marriage. Well, Peter says that the wife must accept the authority of her husband. And he makes a point here that is very important for this time in history. Many uh, of the Jewish people were being converted to Jesus Christ. And some of their mates were not being converted. And the easy thing for them to do would have said, well, they're not a Christian, I'm just going to go find something else. But long, long ago, God said, one man, one woman for life. And Peter is giving some suggestions right now to ladies. And 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul gives men some counsel in the same area. But what he says is the behavior that you show and the respect that you give to your mate is one of the very things that God uses 
in your life to bring your mate to Christ. In fact, if you're married to an unbeliever, you're the only Bible they're reading. So you want to make it a very clear statement. You see what Peter's saying? Treat your mate with dignity and respect. Communicate your love for the Lord, but also your love for me. We do that with, with praise, with encouragement, and with appreciation. Now that's what we do in marriage. Praise, encouragement, appreciation. We do that for each other. And we do that to our children as well. So Peter talks uh, about the fact that many have refused to accept the good news, but their godly wa uh, lives will be a will, will speak more than words. Because they'll watch your pure and godly behavior. And that's why we're told uh, by Paul in another place to make sure that when we marry, we marry a person who's a Christian. Because there's going to be trouble in the marriage if we marry an unbeliever. He says, don't be unequally yoked. I mean, if you put a, 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 a big steer and a, and a donkey and they're pulling a plow, it's not going to work out so well. Mm -hmm. the, the strong one's going to drag it every which way. And in marriage, we want to have a, a good furrow. As we make our mark together as a couple in the world. But many people today are forsaking that idea. And let me just warn you, young people. That if you marry an unbeliever, you're going to have much trouble with the in-laws. And I'm not talking about the parents. Yes, I'm talking about the devil. Mm. Jesus said, "You are of your father, the devil." So when you have a child of God and a child of the devil, you've got a family problem. So avoid that. Joanne and I were both from, from atheistic homes. That was difficult enough. We became Christians right before our marriage. Thank God. Mm. What, uh, 
what happened is we knew that we need some counseling before we got married. She was 17, I was 18. What did we know about life and what did we know about marriage? We didn't have good examples in our homes. I mean, our, fa our, our fathers were, were honorable people. But their marriages weren't really the best they could have been. I was in the Marine Corps at the time when we got married. And I was about to go to war. And I didn't know that the Bible tells us not to go to war after we get married. <laughs> I never got that far in my reading. <laughs> and so when we went to the counselor, and by the way, uh, it's not just going to war. Starting a new business, <coughs> going to graduate school, medical school. The Bible is very clear. It says, take one year after you get married and don't do any of those things until you really get to know each other. So man, our mission is to make our wife the most fulfilled person on this planet. And we can only do that if we know them very well. I was uh, in Israel uh, doing a marriage seminar with my wife. And they meet on Saturdays there. But at Friday, on Friday night, uh, the Sabbath starts in Israel. And the missionary that brought me in to speak, we, we were out on the road on Friday night, and it was getting late towards Sabbath time. And he was so upset. He stopped at every flower shop on the way home. All of them were out of flowers. And I said, Dow, what am I going to do? I said, What's the big deal? Dow, every man in Israel brings their wife. Flowers before the Sabbath. <laughs> I will be the most shameful person in Israel tonight. <laughs> and finally, he saw someone and he pulled off the side of the road and bought some flowers. For his wife and for his neighbor whose husband had died. Mm. Take a lesson, man. Now, most women <laughs> like flowers. Some don't. It doesn't matter if it's flowers or coke. 
<laughs> you find out about her and then you treat her. <laughs> Ladies, is that not the way you want to be treated? Bring something for you. Did he's thinking about you all day long. Now, most men have to work really hard and long hours today to make a living. That, that was our original. That was our original parents' fault. Mm -hmm. Remember? Yeah. The, uh, when God came to the man after they had, he had taken the fruit from the wife. God says, what is this that you've done? Well, the woman that you gave me, it was perfect. So he turned to the woman and God said, Well, it was a serpent that you made. He, he did it. And God turned to the serpent. He didn't have a leg to stand on. We know that the fall changed everything. Man is not now what he intrinsically was, but stands in discontinuity because of the fall. The fall has changed everything. We went to a counselor. We only had one session together. My wife went three times. But the, the Marine Corps they don't let you just leave anytime you want to. So I had to wait and just go to one session. Folks, I promise you, I had never heard the term pre-marriage counseling. But I believe in it so much now. That I take 17 sessions with a couple. Benjamin Franklin. Uh, an important person in history. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. He said, "Go into marriage with your eyes wide open." And then close them halfway. Ahead of time, we need to we need to know that person well. And certainly, we all have faults. So we must make sure that after we marry, we're not always picking on each other's faults. Overlook the faults. Praise, encouragement, appreciation. Well, she doesn't cook as well as her mother, but she just so sweet to me all the time. 
So let the faults go. Focus on the things that they do well. Now, some people take these next verses in Peter and they take them a little out of context. What Peter is trying to get across is make sure your character is good. Don't spend all your time on your outward appearance. Well, you're neglecting your character. So from this passage, some people say, oh, you should never wear any rings or earrings or never fix your hair. But it also mentions dresses here, right? So I'm sure that Peter wasn't saying go around naked all the time. Mm -hmm. Do you see the difference? He's saying, don't let the outward try to cover up what's not there in your character. If you're 16 and you're not beautiful, it's not your fault. If you're 60 and you're not beautiful, it is your fault mm. because you haven't developed your character. The Bible says, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Marry a person of character. It says that uh, what is sweet before God is a, a quiet and gentle spirit. I just read an article uh, this week. It was about a man that married a woman. And she nagged him all the time, you know. Nagging is... Uh, Making him angry? Uh, berating him always. You work too much. You so the article said that without saying a word, he left. And he went to the woods. And he lived in the woods for 10 years. <laughs> Ten years in the woods. And finally he decided, I, I need to talk to somebody. <laughs> but he didn't call his wife. Where have you been for ten years? <laughs> so he called his sister. Where have you been for 10 years? <laughs> well, that's the wrong approach. We don't run from trouble. Do you know churches sometimes have trouble? No, we don't run from trouble. We stand up and stand firm. We do what God called us to do. 
We do it with praise, encouragement, and appreciation. You know, sometimes churches split. We can either look at that and say, oh, that's so terrible, I quit. And we can say, well, you know, sometimes God multiplies things by division. So we pray for the other half that left. But we don't quit. In marriage, we don't quit either. There are some things that are going to happen to you in your lifetime that if you knew them ahead of time, you'd go run and hide in a closet. But because you and your mate are strong together, when those things happen, you get on your knees together. And you take them before Almighty God. And you take strength from what he tells you to do. The Bible talks about a lot of issues. Not just marriage. It talks about money too. It talks about lots of things. That's why we need to read it. Because we won't know what it says if we don't read it. And that means we won't obey everything that he wants us to. To make our life better. Do you know that one of the, the biggest problems in marriage is money? 80% of fights in a marriage center around money? That means we have to have a good plan, don't we? A good plan in every area of life, including money and marriage. Well, I'm going to go back to my marriage counselor. I'm sure he thought these little brats are too young to get married and too stupid. But he was so nice, he didn't say that. He said, for your first year of marriage, you should move away from both set of parents about a thousand miles. Because he knew that couples, when they start out, they have to build their own social units. And then he said, I strongly advise you as new Christians to read your Bible together every day. And before you leave for work, you pray for each other. You pray, pray blessings on your mate that they would have a great day. That God would bless them, encourage them, help them with their tasks. Every day. Do you know I have counseled with couples? They were getting their marriages back together. And there were three cases I can remember where they didn't show up for their next appointment. Because one of the spouses died. Mm. 
Now, how would you like to say some really bad things to your mate and then never see him again? That's a terrible burden. To say good things before you leave. You don't want your wife to remember that, man, he, he told me a laundry list of things to do, but he didn't give any attention to me as a person. We usually don't think about things like this. So for a part, no man banner may meet. We're so busy with our lives, we just go out the door for mad we slam. Shot shot zvavat zain men kai tech gurtziru nein shot urish kai vor banner kanalelu. Do you know we can change our behaviors? Is to kite vor men kai vor men vor kai git zapo. And then with God's help, we can change. Ayo asta zu oknutiam. Maybe you spent your whole life mad and slamming doors. Hmm. Before you say one bad thing to your mate, bite the doorknob on the way out. Bite the doorknob on the way out. Instead of saying something bad to your wife, bite the doorknob on the way out. <laughs> you get that one? Just go over and bite the doorknob before you say anything wrong. You know, once it, once it comes out of your mouth, you can't take it back. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things and say these things. That's what Paul tells us in Philippians. It works in marriage as well. Mm. See, it says the holy women of God were different. They made themselves beautiful by their character. But that doesn't mean they neglected the outward part. Read Proverbs 31. She wore beautiful clothes. She made clothes for her household. And she took care of some business. She invested in real estate. Her husband was known in town because of the good deeds she did to other people. You see, the Bible is clear that we take care of our character and we also have to take care of the outward person as well. It says they trusted God, and therefore they they were able to trust in the authority of their husband. So because they learned to trust Almighty God, they learned to realize that God was going to lead their husband if they prayed for him. Now, men, that doesn't mean that we should make any decision without talking to our wife about it. 
ասում, որ մենք պետք է մեր բոլոր որոշումները առանց մեր գնոչ հետ խորդակցելու կայացնենք։ Remember you picked her out of three and a half billion people. Իշում ես, որ գնոչը տնտրել ես երեկ ու կես միլիարդ մարդկանցի իրոք տգիտություն կլինի, եթե որոշումները չկնարկես կողակցի, թե մինչ մեծ մեծ որոշումներ կայացնելը, դե ինչ եթե դու բիզնեսում ես, ով է լավագույն բիզնես պարտնյորով ընկերը, ավել լավ է, որ կոնկերը, որ ծնկերը կինը կլինի, Ինը կատի չուն է, որ գինը տանդար տեսպես ուսի տասի, ով շտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտտ
That's wrong in any culture, any Live with your wife in an understanding sort of way. Protect her. You're stronger, you take care of her. You don't let any harm come to her. So, physically, she may be weaker. But not spiritually. In fact, spiritually, it says we're exactly the same in this passage in God's sight. The Bible says if you don't treat her this way, that your prayers will be interrupted, short-circuited. Do you want God to hear your prayers? Have a great relationship with your mate. And then he's open to your prayers. He hears them, he answers them. Have you ever felt like your, your prayers didn't get up through the ceiling? Look to your closest partner. Say, I think we need to get on our knees. And we need to have some forgiveness. I was reading last night when Jacob first, my son, went to Mush. Uh, it was three in the morning and I got so interested I just kept reading. He went in the winter, he said it was the coldest he'd ever been in his life. He met a young man in Istanbul and he invited him to his village. And he knew he was probably going to be the first Christian this village had ever met. Since they killed all the Christians. But when he got in the house, they got a basin of water and a towel and they washed his feet. And Jacob said, thank you, God. He told him the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And he was able to witness to people all through Mush. Share the gospel for two weeks. Do you know there's, there's two Christian men in Mush right now? Actually, there's three. Now, one's driving the other two. They're two Armenians. And they went to the, the town record. Record? Records where they have all the uh, uh, data on uh, who lived here during certain periods of time. And they found out that the Kurdish Christian the, the, the Kurdish Christians that was taking them into, into Mush was actually not a Kurd at all. When they found the records, they realized he was an Armenian. He's an older man, retired. 
Արդեն թոշակարու դարեց մեկներ։ And then they started finding out all the different people in the village. Եվ հետո մեկը մյուսի հետևից սկսեցին գյուղում հայտնաբերել հայ ծագում ունեցող մարդկանց, հայերին։ They started witnessing to every Armenian in that town. Եվ սկսեցին այդ քաղաքի մեջ յուրաքանչյուր հայերին։ They were Muslims but they were Armenians before. Հայ մուսուլմաններ էին, այսինքն հայ էին եղել, բայց մուսուլմանին էին դարձրել։ And they're listening to them right now. Hearing the gospel, recognizing the terrible tragedy that took place, the genocide, and realizing that they were taken from their parents and grandparents and left in Muslim families. So seeds were planted, now they're watered. And we're looking for them to come to fruition. That's not what I was going to tell you. I was going to tell you that when you're fighting with your wife, you're not getting along with her, and your prayers aren't getting past the ceiling, washing each other's feet. I promise, if you wash each other's feet in the middle of a fight, that fight will stop. You may have another one later, but that one's going to stop. Jesus told us to do that, didn't he? We really need to do that in marriage. Every couple I've advised to do that. Now we started laughing so hard when we were washing each other's feet. We didn't fight anymore. My daughter works in Pakistan with Christians and villages. By the way, Pastor, will you tell me when I'm going over time? Thank you. And one of the ladies in a, one of these rural, rural villages kind of snuck up to Sarah while she was giving out food and doing some things with the village. Can I have a minute to talk to you? So Sarah said, sure. And then after she finished, she talked to this woman. And here's what the woman said. She said, Sarah, my husband went to America. And he told me something that I don't believe. So I'm going to ask you and you tell me if it's true. He said in America you can walk 20, 30 miles and never get your feet dusty. Sarah said, well, yes, that's true. Because of our sidewalks and couldn't even imagine not washing dirty feet. Let's wash each other's feet as husbands and wives. And when somebody offends you in your family, or you offend somebody in your family, don't say, oh, I'm sorry. That's not what the Bible says to do. I tell men, Get on one knee. Grab your wife's hand. Honey, I sinned against you and against God. 
Will you forgive me? And then wait for the answer. Because she may say yes. And she may say not right now. The Bible doesn't ever tell us to do it the easy way. I'm sorry. No, that doesn't get it. Will you forgive me? When you've offended one of your children, teach them. Will you forgive me? When they offend you, teach them to say, Mommy, will you forgive me? I've sinned against you and against God. You know, they'll, they'll do a lot better in life if they learn to say, Anything else, we just harden our hearts. <laughs> and then we hold on to that bitterness. And the Bible warns us about bitterness. We say in America, if a bitter person spits, the grass never grows again. Because bitterness <laughs> is the one thing <laughs> that will eat a container. <laughs> we're, not, we're not to let any bitterness into our heart <laughs> and, and let it stay there. It says it will grow, it will grow roots in our heart. And then it will spring up and defile those closest to us. Have you ever hold, held on to a hurt or a wrong that's been done yet? How does it feel? It feels terrible. It just sits in there and sees, sits in there and like a bit of till. So be good forgivers. And be good at asking forgiveness. If you do that, life will be so much better. Life's too short to hold bitterness in. It's the acid that eats the container. We're the container. It says if you want a happy life and good days, keep your tongue from speaking evil. And keep your lips from telling lies. And then it says, lean away from evil. And then it says, work really hard at living in peace with one another and with your mate. It says, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. You see that? The eyes of the Lord, it says, look to and fro across the world, looking at the evil and the good. There's not one thing that gets by God. He watches everything. 
and at the judgment seat of Christ. So the least we take with us, the bitterness, hatred, the better off we are when we get there. It says his ears are open to their prayers. That the Lord turns his face against those that do evil. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't hear the prayers of an unbeliever. But Cornelius was an unbeliever. But the Bible says his prayers and alms went up before God. And God sent him to Peter. So he could be led to Christ and become a believer. Right? There was a very important man. He was the president of a huge denomination of Christians. And he made a statement one day. He said, God doesn't hear the prayers of Jews because they're unbelievers. And he said that because there's one place in the Bible that says that God doesn't hear the prayers of an unbeliever. But if you look and see who said that, it was a Pharisee. You have to take everything in context, don't we? Right. Who said it? Who was he talking to? What was going on? God hears everybody. He hears everything we say. I wanted to get to Ephesians, but I don't think I have enough time. Uh, tell me how long. I don't want to go over. Fifteen minutes. Okay. Well, we will go over some. So let's turn over there to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians <coughs> Կանայ՞ <speaking in foreign language> որիր առաջին փարավոր կամ մեծնե եկեղեցին որ չունենա մի արան կամ խորշոմություն կամ ուրիշ բաներ որ սուրբ եւ անարատ լինի այսպես պետք է մարդիկ սիրենց իրենց կանանցը ինչպես իրենց մարմինները ով որ իր կնոջը սիրում է իրանը սիրում բացանցի ոչ ով իրանը չի ատել այդ իրաքումը եւ պահպանում է նրան ինչպես տերն է եկեղեցին պրոֆետեր նրա մարմնի անդամներն են նրա մարմնից եւ նրա ոսկորներից Sora Hamar, Master the Tobay Hore Yel Mora, Yavishkan Kankahare, Yavirkus and Meg Marmin Kline. I swore to Meza by Jes Christosi Yavikavat Sobera Masu. Zakain Duke, me as the me as me oce and Michoce, a man make me can come at all as festive in Spessiranza, Yavkina Vahena in Martita. So you see a husband's love for his wife. That's not like. Is often, is often measured by what he is willing to give up for him. 
հաճախ չափվում է թե ինչ կտա ամուսինը կնոջ համար։ Sometimes we work too much. Երբեմն մենք շատից դու շատ ենք աշխատում։ We don't spend enough time with our families. Մեր ընտանիքի հետ բավականաչափ ժամանակ չենք անցկացվում։ And we know because of the fall we have to work hard. When we work, we should put everything that we have out. Not slack off. Not be on our cell phones while we're working. That's stealing the boss's time. Not taking care of our own bills on the computer. When we're, when we're paid to take care of the boss's bills. So we do have to work hard and we do have to put and not leave anything out. But most people waste so much time at work that people put it all out there. They can leave earlier and get home. So what are you willing to give up? The husband is to love his wife and he is also told to submit to his wife. Now it's true that the wife submits to her husband. We submit to each other. If you ask my children, who makes the decisions in the home? Oh, sometimes mom, sometimes dad. Does that mean we don't talk things over? We come to, we come to a decision together. When it comes to the household and the children, my wife makes much better decisions. I'm educated way beyond my intelligence. That means that my wife's a lot smarter with the kids. What their needs are. She's with them. That means she knows them better. So we submit to each other. But the wife submits as the church submits to Christ. That's the way she submits. To the husband. So the husband has leadership in the family. But without his wife's opinions and help, especially in family matters. He's going to make some wrong decisions. So submit to her. Get her mind on everything. Now we're to love our wife. Make Christ loves the church. How does our wonderful Savior love the church? Well, enough to die for us. He didn't hold anything back. He gave it all for us. It's an impossible role model to follow. Because it's perfect. 
But that's what God tells us to shoot for. To love our Maybe because Christ loves the church. It's a little bit harder job. In fact, the Bible never tells the wife to love her husband. Well, he's a Christian, so you love all Christians, right? But the husband still love her life the And then it says that we're to cleanse her with the word of God. I know I'm an extreme person. I get up at four o'clock in the morning. And, and I have a routine that I go through. When my wife gets up an hour or so later, we have our time of prayer together. We pray for all the kids, all the grandkids, and our two great grandkids, and for each other. Right now we're going through the book of Ezekiel, chapter one time. We'll read the chapter, we'll talk about it, then we read, read a book on missions. And then we also read uh, a devotional book together. So well, now that must take a lot of time. Not really, 45 minutes or so. It's the best 45 minutes of my day. What a great way to start a day. We didn't always do this. We were told to, but we didn't. But we don't miss those days now. My wife is losing her eyesight. And so we went to a specialist. And he sent us to another specialist. He did an MRI. And she had three brain tumors. I, um, I was distressed. Yes, so I got on my knees. And I said, God, this is way above my pay grade. And you decide life and death. So I'm just going to tell you how I feel. And I'm not ready to lose her. I don't care if she comes out of the surgery and she's drooling in a cup. I will take care of her the rest of my life and thank God she came out very well. We never know though, do we? This we never know, so we need to make every moment.
The scripture says the man should leave his father and mother. United as one. But it's a mystery. It represents Christ in his marriage to his church. Every time there's a divorce, it breaks the picture. It breaks his picture of Christ marrying his church. Who said he would never leave us or forsake us. Don't break the picture. That's why God hates divorce. It's because it breaks that picture. Remember when Moses struck the rock? And the water didn't come forth quick enough for him? And he struck it again? And what happened to Moses because of that? He broke the picture of the rock of Jesus being put to death on the cross one time for sins. That was the picture. He broke that picture by hitting it twice. And he wasn't allowed to go into the promise. God, God takes our vows very seriously. Have the pastor come up now and thank you for letting me share these few things with you. God bless you. And I know I talk too fast, so thank you. Can you please pray for the people? Oh, I will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each couple here. Strengthen them in their hearts. I pray also for their children. They can probably have men and women who become a pillar of the church. I pray for all the little ones in the church. That they might grow strong in you and Give the parents the wisdom you gave Solomon, the love and compassion you gave to our Lord Jesus. So each child will feel great love from their parents and be taught about your great love for us and our wonderful Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen.